with the bus. Mm-hmm. In the summer of 1962, my parents purchased a house uh, on Spring Lake Drive. Going to school that early at Northeast, there were very few African Americans, and so um, it was probably overwhelmingly. I mean, had to be at least 95 percent you know, white at that time. Um, most of the students uh, kind of just were going to school, um, but there were the occasions when you know I would get chased home um, from school, from school or chased around the neighborhood. Very very few signs of overt, overt racism. Very few. Um, but it, it was also, but it was there. It was there. There was a teacher who had the same name as my name. <laughs> and I thought, I said, great, this is going to be good. We got the same name, so, you know, we got, we got something in, in common. When the, she called the roll and I said, Fisher, I, I thought that there was going to be something, you know, special there. Uh, not so. Not so. And I think I failed that class too, so maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that has, you know, something to do with it. But, you know, I was, for the most part, we didn't get the, the warm embraces that I was used to getting in, in the schools that, that where we knew the people and they knew us. She could care less about, she, about, you know, me or my mom or my dad or my sister. So I was used to being so uh, embraced and protected in the African-American schools that I attended. Then, uh, and that was totally different when we got to when I got to Northeast High School. You know, we didn't get the same quality of teachers in our community, and they didn't know how to teach our students, and we paid a price for that. By the time I got to the to the twelfth grade, it was uh, j- just the opposite. I mean, there were overwhelming majority of students were African American. We had Black History. Uh, Classes, they called them Negro history classes, and um, so there was a whole new, you know, cultural shift. I think when we look at it from the district perspective, that we still see really strong patterns. Um, that's historical, based on racialized housing patterns and you know old housing discrimination. If you look at the census data of what Oklahoma City looks like. Um, There are a lot of white students who are not in Oklahoma City public schools, but who live in our school district. So, you know, we know that in 1971, when um, the court ordered desegregation in OKCPS, uh, there was a precipitous decline in our student enrollment. Um, Those students fled to private schools. You know, there's a direct correlation between when many of the prestigious private schools in Oklahoma City were founded and Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and that, that's a legacy that those schools are still dealing with today. And we made some really intentional decisions to cross historical lines of racialized housing patterns in the new boundaries that were drawn as we took some schools offline. Um, the decisions that were made based on nine different criteria that ran the gamut from the quality of the facility to the instructional program. Uh, Northeast Academy, we have made the decision to um, split the class in SAS campus, um, the School of Advanced Studies, um, and bring the class in SAS high school into the Northeast Academy building. All of the current students at Northeast Academy who are um, over 90% African American will be able to stay in that environment and it will become one of the most diverse uh, schools in, in the metro area. We're not excited about the fact that we're gonna you know, lose that identity, uh, but uh, it, 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 is, it is progress, I guess. The cost of pro- the price of progress. Um, the churn in leadership in OKCPS caused an environment where it was almost impossible for leaders to keep their promises. Um, and that really has eroded the trust and the relationship between communities and their schools. And I think too, when you talk about trust and, and the community and where it sits, uh, with that, with the district, uh, that's something that's going to have to be addressed with both time and productivity. And the good thing that I really liked about um, our work uh, as a district with the Northeast Task Force was it was not community um, engagement. 
it was more community involvement. The one thing that came out of that was uh, our work at the beginning of this year for Black Male Initiative, where we began to now focus on mentoring opportunities for boys of color, and then also being very intentional about uh, recruiting, developing, and retaining Black male educators. Um, it is not comfortable to talk about race, and um, but the only way out is through. My granddaughter is nine years old, and my grandson is 16 years old. He's in high school and she's in, in fourth grade, I think fourth grade. When they come home from school, they're talking about their friends, you know. They're not talking about their black friends or their white friends or their Mexican friends. They're talking about their friends. They're not telling me that they think that the teacher's prejudice. I haven't heard that one time. I think, you know, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're doing a whole lot better. I just expect now these, these educators to keep working at it and, uh, and, and it'll be all right.